Hello, and welcome to Calculus One. Um, so this is going to be a series of videos, and this is more or less how I would present the material in a classroom. Um, obviously, with, you know, with considerable differences, but um, I, I try to, you know, present the material and do, you know, similar examples to what I would ordinarily do if I were presenting this uh, in a classroom. So, so I'll start with just a very brief history of calculus and sort of its, its origins. Um, it's, uh, as far as we know anyways, uh, it, it's, it started with, uh, in Greece, with, uh, Eudixus, I think I'm spelling this right, and Archimedes, and what they did, what they were trying to do is find the area of a circle, right? I mean, you know, you probably know the formula for it, but uh, they didn't. They had to come up with it, right? And they did it in the most painstakingly way possible, right? So, of course, the, they knew how to find the area of, you know, say, a, a rectangle or a triangle. And so they, they were using triangles. They, they sort of built up a circle from a bunch of triangles. So they started with, you know, it's something like this. Try that one more time. There we go, something like this, right? So you, know, you fill in the, the area of the triangle. You could probably do it better this way. And that's obviously not the full circle, that's just part of it, right? So of course, then they had to fill in the rest with more triangles. So they built another triangle, say, this way. And then another one this, very sloppy, right? And then when they filled those in, if I did this right, yep, that's a little bit closer to a circle. Um, and then they just kept going, right? So these little gaps in here, they filled in with, with more circles. So that's, uh, well, I'm sorry, with more triangles, right? So these were all more and more triangles and, the, and you just get closer and closer to, to the full circle and, you know, so the idea was to get closer and closer to the area of the complete circle, which I'm hoping you know by now. If you know the radius, it's just pi r squared. All right, so that's sort of the, the very beginning of that. Um, and of course, this continued further um, into the Middle East. Um, with, I, uh, I think it's Al Alhazen, Alhazen uh, who worked with uh, sums of powers of the integers, right? So, so they wanted to add, you know, say 1 to the 4th, plus 2 to the 4th, plus 3 to the 4th, and so on. Um, in what's called a series, right? And so that's something you'll see later in the second semester of calculus, right? And then it eventually it got over to Europe where it sort of started with Fermat and Cavalieri. And then of course, um, the, the two that are sort of credited with coming up with, with calculus is of course, Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, I'll just use his last name, Leibniz, and they, they you know, there was a, a, a bit of a feud between them. They, you know, they accused each other of plagiarism and taking, you know, taking their ideas, but uh, historically it's pretty clear that they both, uh, they both sort of developed the ideas independently and came up with sort of a common framework. Up until Newton and Leibniz, 
these were all just little bits and pieces of the whole framework of calculus. And so Newton, what Newton and Leibniz did was sort of put it all together and to give us sort of a, a, coherent, a coherent picture, a coherent framework um, for all these, all these ideas that just got, you know, you know, you know, you know were important in and of their own, uh, you know, for their own ideas. But, um, you know, what we consider calculus, what we're, what we're going to do in this course is mostly based on the ideas of Newton and Leibniz. Um, so, so that, that's, that's as far as I'm going to go with the history. It, again, very interesting history for all this. And of course, it didn't stop with Newton and Leibniz. Um, if you want to talk further about the, the, the rigorous development of what's called analysis, you have to get into players like Cauchy and Weierstrauss. And they, they sort of made these ideas that Newton and Leibniz did uh, a little more mathematical, a little more uh, uh, rigorous. Um, but what, you know, so in particular, Newton wanted to use these ideas, uh, for example, to d discover, or not discover, but to uh, mathematically describe the uh, orbits of the planets around the sun. And Leibniz was more of a, of a pure sort of mathematician, philosopher, and uh, you know, so he, he came at it from a more geometric perspective, I think. Um, but again, they, you know, Newton and Leibniz, the, the main people who are credited with developing calculus, just realize that it wasn't just them. It was a whole bunch of people before that, many that I'm not even mentioning here. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's the, a brief introduction to the history. So with that, let's get started with um, what is calculus? All right, so what are we going to be studying here? So roughly speaking, and again, it's, 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 calculus is really a whole bunch of mathematical ideas, um, but one in particular has to do with the idea of motion, right? and to describe motion mathematically. Um, more generally, it's, it's, it's basically just the mathematics of change. Right? The mathematics of, more specifically, continuous change. Right? So, so yeah, and, and of course, motion is just changing your position, right? So you're, so you have a, something that's some object that starts here, and you move it over here, right? Um, so, you know, so how far did you move it? We can call that the distance or displacement, more generally displacement. Right? So let's say we move this object a distance of 30 feet. And then how long did it take to move the object from here to here? Let's say it took 10 seconds. 10 seconds, I'll, well, I'll abbreviate seconds with just an S, as long as you uh, don't confuse that with a five. Where's my, all right, so 10 seconds, right? So the next natural question you wanna ask is, well, how fast was it moving? Right. So that's the, that's the idea of speed, right? or more specifically, velocity. So a lot of people use these two words uh, sort of synonymously, but there is a slight difference, right? right? Speed is just how fast you're going, right? how fast you're moving. Right? Velocity is how fast you're moving. Um, so it's, it's essentially your speed plus what direction you're going in. Okay, so to, right, to describe your velocity, it's not only how fast you're going, what your speed is, but where you're going, what direction you're traveling in. And, you know, if you're only going, sorry for this little arrow here, if you're going from left to right, if you remember, you think of that as the x-axis here, um, that's in the positive direction. 
So, of course, if you were going backwards this way, you can consider that to be the negative direction. And so your velocity could be positive or negative. Right? On the other hand, your speed is just how fast you're going. It's always positive. Right? So even if you're going from right to left, right, you're still going, right, your speed will still be positive. But your velocity could be negative. OK? So again, we'll, we'll get into more of that later as well. But yeah, so for now, let's, let's calculate our speed, which you should probably know as the distance that you travel divided by how long it took you to travel that distance, divided by the time. Right? And so in our example up here, we traveled 30 feet in 10 seconds. So we traveled three feet per second, right? So yeah, in one second, we moved 10 feet, two seconds, 20 feet, and then three seconds, we moved all the way, 30 feet, okay? But do we, do we know that for sure? How, how do I know that we didn't start out slow, moved a little faster, and then slowed down, and then finished fast again? Right, so we really, all we know is that we started at zero feet and we ended at 30 feet and it took us three seconds to get there. That's, that's all we can figure out from this three feet per second. So on average, right, on average our speed during that trip from zero to 30 feet in 10 seconds was three feet per second, right? So yeah, very specifically we call this the the average speed. Okay. Right. And if you're going left to right in the positive direction, this could also be your average, average velocity. And if we were going the other way, if we're going backwards again, right, your velocity could be negative three feet per second. Right. Okay. So yeah, so that's the idea of average speed or, or average velocity if, if, if you don't mind it being negative. Um, so let's just make that official, right? So let's suppose that we know where we are at any given time. We call that our position. So let's, let's use the function x for position. Um, some books use s. I'll use x. You know, like you're traveling along the x-axis here, right? So you're only going left and right. Right? We're only going horizontally, left or right, right? And again, by convention, we'll say that um, to the right is positive, right? So that's our position, and it depends on what time we take, right? So, right, so let's say that at time t equals 0, we start at position x equals 0, right? Now, I'm not giving units here, so we could use, say, 0 meters and zero seconds, right? We could use feet or seconds. We can use miles or hours. Um, so just be aware that if, if, you know, if you have a problem with units, you should always use units. Um, you know, in, in of course, your, your science courses, you know, that's extremely important. Um, so we'll say it's, it's also important in your math courses to always use the proper units of whatever units were given, right? All right, so, so yeah, at any given time, we have our position. So at time, let's say t is equal to, I don't know, a, so a seconds, we're at this position here, which we can label as x, at time t equals a, right? So this is the idea of a function. And I'm not going to review what functions are. You should know that from your algebra days, your pre-calc days. Um, so position, right, as a function of time. And let's make this a little more concrete. Let's do an actual example. Right, so let's suppose our position function x of t is just, um, yeah, let's make it t squared plus 3 times t. Okay? 
So what this is telling us is, right, our position x at any given time, t. Okay? So, for example, uh, at 0 seconds, where are we? We're at 0 squared plus 3 times 0. We're at 0 meters or 0 feet, right? We're at position 0. So we're starting out at 0, like I indicated earlier, right? So where are we after, let's say, four seconds or four units of time? Right? So here's our position, right? We replace t with 4. We get 4 squared plus 3 times 4, right? So 16 plus 12, we are at position 28, right? Where are we after five seconds? All right, so same function, 5 squared plus 3 times 5, All right, so 25 plus 15 is 40. So 40 meters, 40 feet, right? That's our position. That's where we are at the time t equals 5. Okay. All right, so now we can calculate how fast we're going on average. So let's calculate our average speed. I'll actually, I'll call it velocity at this point. Our average velocity from, let's say, time t equals 1 to t is equal to 5. Right? So we start the clock. Instead of starting our clock at 0, we're going to start our clock, or watch, at uh, t equals 1 and then go to t equals 5, right? So we can start any time we want. We can start at 0, we can start at 1, we can start at 2. Um, but I just decided to start at, at t equals 1 second, and we're going to 5 seconds. Right, so how fast were we, were, were we going over that, over that 4 second interval, right? So this is a 4 second time interval. So it's just the distance you travel. So what we're going to do is take the position, right, starting, uh, well, starting at 1 and going to 5. But notice the further along you go, uh, the more time has passed. So as time passes, you're going further and further to the right, right? So the difference between these two positions is the distance we travel, right? So yeah, we can think of this as your distance. Um, and if it's negative, it'll be displacement. But We'll call it distance for now, right? And then the time interval, right? Well, it was four seconds, right? Five minus one. Okay. So let's plug in the numbers here, right? We know what x of five was. x of five, we calculated before, was 40. And x of one, well, we didn't calculate that. But we can do it now. Just plug in t equals one. We get one squared plus 3 times 1. So 1 plus 3 is 4. So yeah, x of 1 is equal to 4, divided by 5 minus 1, which of course is 4. So the numerator, 40 minus 4, is 36. The denominator, 5 minus 1, is 4. So 36 divided by 4 is 9. And that's our average velocity, right? So to make this a little more concrete, maybe I will use units here. Let's say distance is in meters and time is in seconds. So this is 9 meters per second. So on average, that's how fast we were going, at least on this time interval, right? From t equals 1 to t equals 5 uh, seconds. OK, so nothing new, right? This is hopefully calculations you did before when you're calculating speed or velocity. All right, and now I think we can generalize this. Um, so if we want the average velocity from any time to any time, right? So let's say from t is equal to, let's say, a seconds to t is equal to b seconds, right, from a to b. Um, so the distance you traveled, right, so the distance is just x of b minus x of a. Remember, we're starting at the final time, subtracting the 
position at the initial time. And then the time interval, of course, is just b minus a. Right? So th this is, yeah, so that's distance over time. There you go. Um, which, of course, is the same as your average velocity. So this is average velocity. All right, more generally, right? And something like this might look familiar to you. Um, maybe in a different context, we could write it this way. We could write it as y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And, you know, so the x's here is not the position anymore. These are, these are the times, so t2 minus t1. And the y's are really just the x's, x2 minus x1. So I know that's a little confusing. However, this formula you might remember is the formula for slope. Okay, so there's a connection between slope and velocity. Okay. So maybe, maybe it's not quite clear at the moment. Um, so to make it a little clear, I hope, um, Let's look at a graph, a little bit sloppy here. So this is my time, t, and this is my position, x. So you have some function. I mean, it doesn't have to be this function up here, right? This, is, this was one example, t squared plus 3t. It could be any function of, of t. Um, so maybe your position looks like this. You're starting at 0, just for convenience. And then you go a little bit faster here, and you speed up, and you slow down, right? And then maybe we turn around and go backwards, and we slow down again, and go forwards a little. And let's say we stop right here, right? So that's where we end. Okay, so let's say this is t2, and we're starting at t1, which could be 0, right? right. And we're, we're starting at position say, x1, and we're ending at position x2, right? So, right, if we want the velocity again, again, specifically the average velocity, right, we just take the difference in the positions, x2 minus x1, over t2 minus t1. So we take this vertical dis difference here, the vertical distance, and divide by the horizontal distance. Or, if you prefer, it's the rise divided by the run. And you might remember that's a very uh, instinctive way to remember slope. Right? Informally, it's rise over run. The rise being the vertical distance, the difference in the y's, or in this case, the difference in the x's, and the run being the horizontal distance, the difference either in the x's, or in this case, the t's, right? So, so yeah, it's just the slope. The slope of what, though? So it's going to be the slope of the line starting at this point here and ending, I'm going to try to draw a straight line here, ending at this point here. So this point is t2, x2, and this point way down here is, well, t1, x1. Okay, so yes, the slope of this line is your average speed, or average velocity, right? At least from time t equals one to t equals two. Obviously, if we took a different time interval, we would get a different average velocity, right? Okay, well, uh, so, so that's one question you can ask. How fast were we going on average, right? right? So maybe one more quick example to, just to make sure you understand this concept of average, average speed or average velocity, average speed. Or velocity, I'll make it positive again. So in this case, speed and velocity are the same as long as it's positive, right? It's, it's all to the right. 
So let's say I get in a car and I travel a distance of 200 miles and it takes me five, uh, takes me four hours to make that trip. So during that four hour trip, how fast was I traveling? Well, on average, 50 miles per hour, right? 200 divided by four is 50, right? So 50 miles per hour. Again, that's your average speed for the whole trip. Now, it's very unlikely that I was traveling 50 miles per hour the entire way. Obviously, I have to start from zero, right, and then speed up, and then maybe slow down, and then speed up, and maybe come to a stop, and then speed up again, and then come to a stop. So, yeah, so over, again, this is my t-axis for time, and then the vertical is your x-axis. Um, Right, so if I just want the average velocity, your starting point and your ending point is about here. The slope of that line corresponds to this number, the average velocity. Okay. But suppose I'm roughly halfway through my trip, right? somewhere right around here, let's say. Um, so this is a given moment in time. Right? It could be let's say 1.6 hours after I started from zero, right? So we started at t equals zero and we ended at t equals four hours. So yeah, somewhere in between, I'm at 1.6 hours. And at that moment, I look down at my speedometer and what do I see? Well, this number here does not tell us how fast we're going. This just tells us where we are, right? This is our position, right? This is x at 1.6 hours. It doesn't tell us how fast we're going. Right? What tells us how fast we're going is going to be the slope of this line right here. The line that just touches the graph. Oh, it's, and it's about the same, I guess. Maybe a little bit less. Yeah. That just touches the graph without actually crossing it. And I know this is a very, maybe just a very sloppy picture here. So let's see if I can find a different time here. So at a different time, let's say right here, what was my speed? Well, it was much faster than the average speed, right? I was, right, a bigger slope means a bigger speed, okay? Over here, however, at this time, my slope is almost zero here, so maybe maybe it's slightly negative. So that tells me my speed was a little bit negative at that point. So what I'm getting at is how do we calculate the speed at any given moment? Space here. So how do we calculate the speed or velocity at an instant in time? at one moment, right? And again, we can pick a, pick a specific time here. Let's say that, let's just make it one hour, right? One hour, so at one hour, t equals one hour, how fast were we going? Well, if we try to use this formula here, it's not gonna work, right? If we try to use the average speed formula what would we do? Well, we're starting at time t equals one hour, right? Uh, well, let me write down the formula, right? So t2 minus t1 in the denominator and x of t2 minus x of t1 in the numerator. Uh, I'm calling it x1, but it's x of t1. You can call it x1 as well, right? So yeah, x2 minus x1 over t2 minus t1. So what are my t's here? Well, I'm starting at one hour, but this is a moment. This is an instant in time. So my t2 is also one hour, right? Because if my t2 is, say, 1.6 hours, then that's an average speed again. That's not instant, right? So we don't want that. We want the speed at a given time. So my two t's are the same. They're both equal to one. So one minus one. 
My x's, however, and we didn't specify, but let's say this position here is um, you know, 80 miles. So, so at t equals one hour, we're at 80 miles, and at t equals one hour, we're also at 80 miles. So what's 80 minus 80? Zero. What's one minus one? Zero. So our average speed was zero divided by zero. But zero divided by zero is nonsense. We have no idea what zero divided by, right? Remember, you cannot divide by zero, for one thing, right? You can never have zero in the denominator. Um, but zero divided by zero is an, a, a, an undefined concept, right? It's undefined. It actually could be anything. It could be any number we want, right? So this another word, another word, uh, another name to describe zero divided by zero is using the word indeterminate. It could be anything. Okay, so zero divided by zero is indeterminate. So what does that mean? It means our speed at this moment could be anything doesn't make any sense, right? So the, 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 there's something going on here, right? H how can we say that at this given time, we didn't have a defined speed? All I have to do is look down at my speedometer, you know, and it might say 62 miles per hour. But that's not undefined. That's not indeterminate. But trying to use this formula here obviously didn't work. So what went wrong, of course, is that we're trying to use the same time for both T1 and T2. You can't do that because it's the same time. You, you would end up dividing by zero here. Okay. So, so we still don't know, at least mathematically, how can we find the speed at a given moment in time? Because using this average speed, average velocity formula just just doesn't work for us. It's, it's not the correct formula for the average, for the instantaneous speed, right? So there's a big difference between the average speed and what we're looking for, which is sometimes called the instantaneous speed. Or velocity. Right? I'll stick with speed for now. Okay. Yeah, so in order to find the instantaneous speed, well, right, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of calculus, right? It's not a question of algebra or geometry or using the formula for, for the for slope here, right? right? So it has to do with this concept geometrically called a tangent line, right? So the lines that we were doing over here, right, this blue line here, is sometimes called a secant line. And you might remember the word secant from your trigonometry days, from your pre-calc days. As far as I know, it has nothing to do with the secant of an angle or anything. It's, 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 a, it's the same word used in a different context, okay? But what we're looking for here is, for the instantaneous speed, we're looking for the slope at a given point. And for that, if we only know one point on the graph, we get this line here. This is called a tangent line. And again, it has nothing to do with the tangent function from, from trigonometry, as far as I know. It's just, a, it's, just a, it's just another word to describe a line that only crosses a, a graph at one point rather than two points, right? For a secant line, it passed the graph over here on the left and, and again over here on the right. But for the tangent line, it's only touching at that one point, right? Same thing here, just a little bit sloppier. It's only touching the graph at one point. Okay. So yeah, that's the connection between velocity and slope, right? Your average, uh, let, me, let me clear this and start over. Um, and we'll resume. Okay, so yeah, so we have two graphs here. Notice they're practically the same graph, but just as a different context, right? This is x as a function of t, 
which represents our position, right, if we're, if we're moving, right? And over here, this is just the graph of some function y as a function of x. That's how we usually think of functions, right? y is the dependent variable, x is the independent variable. And up here, t is the independent variable, x is the dependent variable, right? So your position depends on time. So t for time, x for position. or just x and y in general. Right. Okay, so when you're talking about, let's start with just the graph, y equals f of x. If we start at one point, let's say x1, and then the y-coordinate will be y1, and then over here, we have another point where x is x2, and then y is, let's say, y2, right? So this point has coordinates x1, comma, y1. This point has coordinates x2, comma, y2. And the idea is we can connect these two points with a straight line, or in this case, a line segment. But you know, in general, the line keeps going in both directions. Right. And so if you want to calculate the slope of that line, do it down here. The slope is the usual formula, right? Rise over run. The rise is the difference in the y values, y2 minus y1. And the run is the difference in the x values, x2 minus x1. Right. Okay. Right. Same thing up here, right? If we start at a specific time, let's say t1, and we know we're starting at position 1 here. So this, this point has coordinates t1, x1. And then we end up over here after time t2. We are at position x2. So this point has coordinates, right? Oh, sorry, t comes first here. t2, x2. I hope that's not too sloppy. And again, when you connect the two points with a straight line, and the slope of that line is just the difference in the x's, x2 minus x1. Oops. Again, rise over run. So x2 minus x1 divided by t2 minus t1. But specifically, what that means is, right, this is the distance that you traveled, or displacement, divided by the time, also known as average velocity. So again, I hope that makes this clear, the connection between slope and average velocity. OK. But now our question is going to be a little bit different, because instead of knowing the average velocity or the slope of a secant line, remember this was a secant line here. Suppose, um, need that much space. All right, let's try this. So let's go back. Um, I'll, you know what? I'll stick with x and y here. Although keep in mind, this could also be t. And then y could also just be x. And then we have our graph. Slightly more exaggerated. And the idea is, at a given time, let's say this time right here, uh, or x, right? I'll stick with x. We want to know the slope at this point, right? So this is my x, this is my y, and that's all I know. At this point, I can draw a line. I'm drawing a little dotted line or dashed line here that just touches the graph at this point. That's what makes it a tangent line. So how do I find the slope of this tangent line? Well, let's, let's see. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. But there's only one x, right? Whether you call it x1 or x2 or x3 or x4, doesn't matter, right? And there's only one y, right? It could be y1 or y2 or just y. So they're all the same. This is just y 
minus y over x minus x. Again, 0 over 0. Right? Now looking at the, if you remember what slope describes, slope essentially describes how steep the line is, right? right? So it's a number that describes how steep the line is. And looking at this line, it looks like the slope might be, I don't know, somewhere around 1. Right? Rise over run is about 1, maybe a little less than 1, 0.9 or something. But it's, it's about 1, right? It's not 0 over 0, right? 0 over 0 is not 1. Right? 0 over 0 could be anything. It could be 2. It could be 5. It could be a million. It could be negative pi, right? It could be any number you want. So again, this formula for slope only works for secant lines. It does not work for tangent lines. Likewise, if you remember, we tried this before in calculating the, not the average velocity, but when we tried to calculate the instant or instantaneous velocity using the same formula, we ended up with 0 over 0, which of course is nonsense. So anytime you get 0 divided by 0, you did something wrong, right? You used the wrong formula. Or, or right, you're, getting, you're getting something that's indeterminate, something that we just don't know what it is. Okay, so 0 over 0 is never an answer. It, it's, it's just meaningless. Right? So, so yeah, so, so don't use 0 over 0 to describe anything. Right. But it still leaves open the question then, how do you calculate the slope of a tangent line or how do you calculate the instantaneous velocity? And again, that's, that's a calculus question, right? So this is sometimes referred to as the tangent line problem, right? And it, it's not going to be long before we answer this question. So this won't be a mystery for long. But for now, um, yeah, we don't know how to calculate the slope of the tangent line. So this is the tangent line problem. Or, and it's, it's, right, it's the same as the instantaneous velocity problem, right? So this is also, if we want to calculate instantaneous velocity. Right. Let's try that again, instantaneous velocity. Okay, right. So yeah, we know how to calculate average velocity, and we know how to calculate the slope of a secant line, but we're still left with the mystery of how do you calculate the slope of a tangent line or the instantaneous velocity. And maybe just to relate it to one of our examples we did earlier, right? If I get in a car and I travel 200 miles, right, in five, in five hours, I think I said four hours, doesn't matter. Okay, so four, 200 miles in four hours, right? That was 50 miles per hour on average, right? So this is our, this is our average speed for the whole trip. Right. So yeah, here's the road. We're starting over here at zero. And then we travel 200 miles, right? So this is, uh, sorry, 200 miles. And we did it in four hours time. So for that whole trip, the average speed, 50 miles per hour. Okay. So, all right, so now we're somewhere here. Let's say this is three hours later. And we take a picture of the car at that moment in time, right? So you take a, a snapshot and what you'll see is the car just sitting there. Right? If you take a true snapshot, of the car, you can't tell that it's moving, right? So it'll look like, I mean, you know, it'll look like you took the picture of a car that's just sitting there, right? So, right, so that's a true snapshot at that given moment in time, right? So at that moment, it traveled zero, over zero seconds, it traveled zero miles. And so again, we don't know what that is. We don't know how fast it was going at that moment. Okay. 
On the other hand, and this is sort of a way around how to calculate the instantaneous velocity. If you really do take a picture of a moving car, right, it's not going to look like it's standing still. The picture is going to be a little bit blurry, right? So pretend this is a car. Sorry, I'm not good at drawing cars, right? What you'll see is a little bit of a faint image here. Right? The car will be sort of blurred out, right? And based on that, we can, we can basically say, look, that the, the picture is not a true snapshot. The car actually traveled during that short time that the, the shutter was open for the, the old-fashioned cameras that use shutters, right? So it might have been a very short time, right? We might be talking about, you know, one ten-thousandth of a second, right? And in that time, we can, we can measure this little distance here, right? We can measure this little blur. And let's say it was, um, let's say it was uh, 0 0.4 feet, right? So again, a very short distance, but also a very short time. But it's still a distance and it's still a time. So now I can calculate the speed by taking the distance, 0 0.4 feet, divided by the time, 1 1,000th of a second, And now I get an actual number. I get a very big number. I get 400 feet per second, which is actually pretty fast. It's very fast for a car, um, right? But, but that is the idea of a speed. This is how fast you are going, not at any given moment, but during that time interval, right? So this is still an average speed. It's not an instantaneous speed, right? Because we do have some very short time interval here Right? and a very short distance as well. But it's still the average speed. Now, at this moment, after three hours, we can say roughly that the speed might be 400 feet per second. Right? So that's not an unreasonable assumption that because this is a, such a short time interval, only one one thousandth of a second, that, you know, you know, that one thousandth of a second earlier at three hours, right, and then Right? So this would be, on the left here, this would be three hours. And then on the right here, this would be three hours plus one one thousandth of a second, which is you know, barely a blip, right? So, so yeah, that's almost an instant in time. Not quite, but very close to an instant. And so this, this average speed might be a very good approximation to the instantaneous speed. Maybe not exactly, but perhaps close enough. So that's sort of the idea of how we go from instant, uh, uh, average speed to instantaneous speed, or how we go from the slope of a secant line to the slope of a tangent line. Okay. So this idea of making your time intervals smaller and smaller and smaller and of course, that makes your distance smaller and smaller and smaller, is this concept of a limit. Okay. And that's what we're going to be studying in the next series of videos, basically in the, in the first chapter here. Okay. So, so I'm just going to pause a little bit here to, to sort of uh, take everything that we've done into, uh, into some perspective here. Because we're talking about positions and velocities, we're also talking about tangent lines and secant lines, and you know, I just want to make sure that you know you're not confused by all this. Um, I mean, it, you might be at first, but I think after you read this section, and uh, certainly when we get into chapter two, this all this will become much more clear. But this is just a, a very brief introduction, a very brief survey of what we're going to be doing. Um, at least for you know for a little while. Um, so so the next thing uh, we want to talk about is area. Okay, so area, right? We know how to calculate area of a rectangle, right? So you have the length times the width. So the area is just 
length times width. For a triangle, and it doesn't have to be a right triangle, by the way. Um, it could be any triangle. Right? So instead of calling this the length, we call this the, the base, B. And then we call this the H for height. So here the area is 1 half the base times the height for a triangle. And of course, for a circle, you have the radius, R, and the area, let's call it A for area, is just pi R squared. Right? And in the back of your book, you have more formulas for more complicated objects like trapezoids, things like that. And you can also talk about the surface area of a sphere or a prism or a rectangular solid or something like that. So we'll get into volume as well later. But uh, for now, we're just talking about area. So yeah, as long as you're talking about rectangles or triangles or circles, no problem, right? We know how to find the area, or at least we know how to look up the formula for it, right? Um, but by now you should know these, I would hope. But suppose we have something a little more complicated, right? Suppose we have a graph. Suppose the graph looks like this. It might be some sort of a parabola, like a quadratic function. Right. Could just be y equals x squared, for example. Okay. So again, the graph goes on forever, of course, in both directions. But let's suppose that we just want to measure, let's say, the area from x equals 0 to x equals 1. So we want to calculate the area of this region. I guess I'll highlight this area in red. There we go. So yeah, what's this red area in here? Okay, so yeah, it's not it's not a rectangle, it's not a circle, it's not a triangle, although it sort of looks like it, right? If if I just draw this straight line here, you can see that this red area is a little bit less than the area of the triangle. But how much less exactly? Right? So yeah, when you're talking about areas of curved regions like this, you know, I can even draw a more a weird curve like this. Right? And I want to calculate the area of this region, which again I'll highlight in red. Yeah, that's not an easy problem, obviously, right? And in particular because it's just not one of the figures that we have. It's not a rectangle, it's not a triangle, it's not a circle. So calculating the areas of these um, will involve a new technique, right? A new technique of calculus. And the way we're going to do it, again, just to give you a preview, not to do it with any specificity at the moment. This, you know, this we'll see a little bit later in the course. So, okay, so we have our region here, and we want to calculate this area in red here, right? So the idea is very somewhat in a similar way of talking about the instantaneous speed. We're taking our units of time and dividing it up into shorter and shorter units, right? So the idea is to break this interval up into small pieces. Right? I'm trying to make them uniform, although they don't have to be. And if we think of these as the widths or the lengths of some triangles, right? then I can draw a triangle. Well, actually, I'd rather use rectangles. So let's say I draw this rectangle here, and then this rectangle here, and then maybe this one here, this one here. You get the idea. And they're not exactly rectangles, but you know, pretend they are close enough here. Okay, so let's Fill in all that area in here. If I did it right, yeah. Oh, these two as well. Yeah. So this red area in here is obviously, sorry, not the exact area that we're looking for. But if you notice, it's pretty close, right? It's not. Uh, it's not far off. So this might be a good approximation 
to the area that we want, right? We want this. We want the exact area. But as I said, that's a hard problem. That's not easy to find. But we know how to find the area of a rectangle. Um, we just add up the areas of all these individual rectangles here, which I kind of obscured, but these are all just little rectangles. Okay. So you add up all these areas and you get a pretty good, pretty good idea of what the area is. It may be a little bit off, right? There, obviously there are these little gaps in here that, that aren't up here. Right? There's no gaps up here. Um, but then there's parts of the area that go above the curve, which are not counted up here either. Right? There's, there's no area above the curve. It's just the area below it. Right? So uh, maybe on average, this is a pretty good approximation. Maybe not. I don't know. But it, it, it can't be that far off. Right? Right. So that's the idea. Right? We divide this interval into smaller and smaller rectangles. And, right, it's, it's obviously a very tedious calculation because you have to calculate the area of every single rectangle and add them all up. So if you have 10 rectangles, that, that might take a while. Right? But if you want a better approximation, you might want to use more rectangles. You might want to use 50 rectangles or 100. But then that just gets more and more tedious. Right? Um, so in some sense, there should be sort of a pattern here of not just being able to, you know, add up all these individual rectangles, but maybe there's a pattern where that sum, even though it's a very long sum if there's 100 rectangles, um, in some sense will approximate, better approximate the area of this region up here, the exact region. Right. right. So, so this, is the, this is the problem of finding the area of any curved region, not just circles right, or triangles or rectangles. So that will come up a little bit later, uh, again, using calculus, right? And just to give you the sort of the, the terminology here, the process of finding the area uh, using a sum, using what's called sometimes like a continuous sum, is called integration. It's the process of integration. So when we were talking about tangent lines, uh, finding the slope of a tangent line, we use a process called differentiation. That's supposed to be an F. Differentiation. And even though there's entirely no reason to believe this, but differentiation and integration are just inverse processes. Integration is just differentiation going backwards. Right. Not easy to tell. You know, this area business... Has, but, you know, what, is, what does that have to do with tangent lines or instantaneous speeds? Right. And maybe I'll give you a reference later um, for, uh, right, for a good visual for that, because I, I can't draw motion here very much um, or even areas all that well. Um, but there are some very good uh, explanations out there for, for that thing, the, the, you know, the process of integration and differentiating being uh, inverse processes. But again, we don't have to worry about that just yet. OK, so I think I'll end with a couple examples. And um, I actually pulled this right from the book. Um, so this is part of your homework, um, I think. So, so yeah, the question says, or the problem is to find uh, the distance traveled in 15 seconds by an object traveling at a constant velocity of 20 feet per second. Now, since they didn't give us a direction, you know, velocity and speed are synonymous here. Um, but, you know, velocity means it's 20 feet per second in the positive direction. Um, again, the positive direction, we don't know what that is. Typically, it could be to the right. right? But it could also be going up, too. So either up or to the right is considered positive, down and to the left is considered negative. But that's just a convention, right? If you want to go to the left and consider that to be positive, that's OK. If you want to consider downward to be positive, that's OK too. Um, so right, it doesn't matter what direction it's going in, in some sense. It's going in some direction at a constant velocity or speed of 20 feet per second. 
So how far did it travel in 15 seconds? Well, remember, if the velocity is the distance divided by time, and that's actually not quite right. Uh, velocity is displacement divided by time. Displacement is not just how far you traveled, but in what direction. Right? So displacement you can think of as a change in your position. Right? And that change could be positive or negative. But distance is just how far you traveled, which is always positive. Right? So that distance here is 20 feet. Right? And then the time, well, is, is in seconds. Right? So if distance divided by time equals velocity, then multiply by time, your distance is just velocity right, times time. Right? And in this case, the velocity was given. It was 20 feet per second. And now we multiply by the time. The time was given as well, 15 seconds. And you can see what happens. The seconds, this is seconds divided by seconds. So the seconds cancels, right? And we just multiply 20 times 15, which is 300 feet. So yeah, not a hard problem. Um, one that I'm hoping you should be able to do pretty easily, right? So yeah, there's no calculus involved in this at all, right? This is just knowing the relationship between distance, velocity, and time, something I'm hoping that you're comfortable with, right? Velocity being distance divided by time or, t or distance being velocity times time. Okay, yeah. So what made this easy was this keyword here. The keyword is constant, right? What do we mean by constant velocity? We mean just uniform velocity. It's 20 feet per second all the way from the start. We're not changing our speed at all. It is constant. So we start at zero seconds, we end at 15 seconds, and we travel 20 feet each second. And so the total distance that we traveled was 300 feet. Okay, now if we go on to the next question down here, now we want to find the distance traveled in the same time interval, 15 seconds, by an object moving with a velocity right, of this function here. V of t is 20 plus 7 times the cosine of t. Now, I'm hoping you remember what the cosine function is. That's a trigonometry question, right? Um, but it's just some, it's a trigonometric function, right? It's, it's a constant 20 plus 7 times cosine of t. So, right, so the key thing here is that this is going to be a much harder question because the velocity is not a constant. It depends on t in a non-uniform way, right? right. Yeah. So here, in this problem, v you could say is a function of t, but it's a constant function. It's just 20, right? There's no t here, right? But in this formula, there is a t. Sorry. Right, so how do we calculate the velocity here? Well, again, it's a, it's a calculus question, right? So it's one that we're really not going to be able to answer completely here, right? And the book, to, you know, to be fair, the book basically says just estimate the answer. Just, you know, figure out what's your best guess, right? Um, but even that's kind of an involved question. So it, it's one that I'll talk about very briefly here. Um, to help us answer this question, let's go back to this, right? So here's another way we can think of this problem here. Um, let's draw the graph, right? This is your velocity v. And this is your time t. So this is, let's say, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And then this is our velocity, let's say, 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds. So I know this is not a 
to scale here, but that's fine, right? So this is 20 feet per second, and it's constant, right? It's not changing over 15 seconds, right? So, right, so we have 20, 20 feet per second is the height or the width, and the 15 seconds is the length. So how do you find the area of this rectangle? Right, length times width, or 15 times 20, which of course is again 300. So yeah, in some sense, the area of this rectangle is also the distance. So how does that help, right? So yeah, velocity is, yeah, in this case, the velocity is the, is the height, and the time is the length, the horizontal distance. And when you multiply 15 times 20, or 20 times 15, you get 300. So how does that help with this question? Well, it doesn't, at least not directly. So let's, let's draw the graph of this function here. And again, we're still going from 5, 10, 15 seconds. And what's the velocity? So the velocity is not going to be a horizontal line here. It's going to depend on t. And if you remember the cosine function, right, when t is 0, right, cosine is 1. So when t is 0, your velocity is 20 plus 7. It's 27, so way up here. Right. And when t is pi, Cosine is negative 1. Right? So after pi seconds, right, it's about 3.14 seconds, right? your velocity will be 20 minus 7, will be 13. So let's see, where's pi? It's right about here. Right? And so let's say this is 13. So now we're at the bottom. And then a 2 pi again, which is right around here. We're at the top. And so on. You just repeat, right? So down, up, down, up. Um, let me see if I got this right. So that's roughly the shape of the cosine function. It's very, very sloppy here. Um, so let's see. This is 6, 12. Yeah, that's about right. So this would be 4 pi, and then 5 pi, I think, would be just a little bit past here. Um, so, yeah, let me see if I can erase this, because I think I got this a little bit, a little bit too compressed here. So, yeah, at 5 pi, so, yeah, this is one period, two periods, and then three periods. So this would be sort of at the bottom here rather than at the top after five pi. Right. So, yeah. so and then it goes back up. But we're, st we're stopping at 15 actually, right? So yeah, all we need to do then is calculate the area of this region. And that will be our distance in much the same way that the distance uh, in the previous problem was just the area of this little rectangle. The problem is this is not a rectangle, right? So, so yeah, that finding the area of this is no easy task. But I'm going to suggest one way to do it, and this may not be exact, but right here in the middle should be 20. And if I just draw this horizontal line, well, you can kind of see what's going on here, right? This area that's not under the curve might match this area in here. So this area above it might fill this in. Consequently, this area up here will fill in this area. And then this area will fill in this area and so on. So, right, and then this should fill it, and it's a little sloppy here, but that'll fill in that area. 
Right. And so this rectangle here will be pretty close to the actual distance. The length is still 15, right, 15 seconds, and the height is still 20 for 20 feet per second. But you can see that this is not going to be exact because there's still this area that's not accounted for here. So I think the, the area is going to be a little bit bigger than this. Uh, this was, what, 300 feet? So, so what would this area in here be? Well, that's kind of hard to tell. Um, oh, actually, I, yeah. Again, a lousy picture here because the true bottom here, wh where it would fill in, would be at 5 pi, which would include this area as well, which is not really there. Right? So, so in other words, right, we've, over, we've over calculated this by this much here. Okay, so how much is that? Well, it's a tiny little bit more. Right. I don't know how much more, maybe three or four feet, right? So roughly 303 feet, maybe. We want to include that as well. So how far did we travel here in 15 seconds? I'll say very approximately, somewhere around 303 to 305 feet. Okay, but that again, that's really just a guess at this point. Um, could be 310 feet, I don't know. Um, yeah, but if you want the precise answer, then you just have to use calculus to do that. And this is something we will do, again, a little bit later, um, right after we get through the ideas of limits and derivatives. When we talk about integrals, integration here, that should, should be able to help us find the answer a little bit easier. Okay. So yeah, when you, when you see a problem like this that you can't do using ordinary, you know, rectangles, triangles, using ordinary algebra and geometry, chances are you have to use calculus for that. Okay. And it's because we're not moving at a constant velocity here. Right. So this velocity here is not a constant. And that's what made this so hard. Okay. So I hope that helps. And now we'll do another example. Okay, so this uh, is number eight in the book. So I just picked this right out of the book. And it says to consider the function f of x equals 6x minus x squared and the point p, which in this case is the point 2, 8 on the graph. And you can get that just by plugging in x equals 2 here. So if I calculate f of 2, I get 6 times 2 minus 2 squared. So that's 12 minus 4, which is, of course, 8. So that's, that's the 8 here, of course. Um, yeah, but they, you know, they gave that to us, so we don't have to do that. So we want us to graph the function and the secant lines passing through two 8s uh, and three different points. Uh, the three points here, I should say, are when x is 3 and x is 2.5 and x is 1.5. And uh, I, I think I'm just going to do the, the 3 and the 2.5. If you want to do 1.5, that's OK, too. Uh, actually, I changed my mind. I think I want to do just the 2.5 and the 1.5. So forget the 3. You can try that on your own. Um, all right, so 2.5 and 1.5. And then find the slope of each secant line. And then using these results, can we estimate the slope of a tangent line? Again, the tangent line is the hard part, right? So yeah, the, the finding the slope of the tangent line, we're just going to kind of guess or approximate or estimate. Right. So yeah, so let's start with the graph. Now, this is going to be a little bit sloppy here, but I'll do the best I can. So let me do that down here. So for part A, I should even make this bigger. Um, see. Okay, so so this is x equals one, x equals two, x equals three. Um, this will be one point five, and 
this will be 2.5. And I have to change the scale here, so this will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. And just to remind you, the graph we want is f of x equals 6x minus x squared. All right. So it's a quadratic function, and you should remember what that looks like. It's just a parabola. All right. When x is 0, y is 0. All right. And uh, when x is 6, I think y is also 0. When x is 3, you get to the, um, the vertex. So I think 18 minus 9 is 9, so this is the point 3, 9. This will be the point 2, 8. And when x is 1, we get 6 minus 1, which is 5. I think that's 5 here. So connecting the dots, I'm going to do the best I can here. It's very hard for me to draw this. And I'm missing by a little bit, but that's okay. And then if I were to continue, this would just keep going down until you get to 6. Okay. So that's roughly the graph. I know it's a little sloppy, but hopefully this will do okay. All right, so what was the question? The question was to graph the function. We did that. And find the... Oh, and the secant lines passing through 2.8 and 2.5. So, right, so right around here, I think that's right, yep, is the point 2.8. So what happens when x is 2.5? Well, just calculate the y. This is 6 times 2.5 minus 2.5 squared, sorry, 2.5 squared. And in no way do you have to do this by hand, of course. You have a calculator, uh, or you should have a calculator, so you can go ahead and use it. And my calculator spits out 8.75. So, yep, at 2.5 here, this point x is 2.5, y is 8.75, so just under 9. And so we want to connect these two points with a straight line. Okay, not very straight, but close enough, right? It's a line. Or maybe better yet, let me blow this up down here just to show you what's really going on here, right? So we have this curve, something like this. This will be the point, oops, sorry, 2.5. So x is 2.5, y is 8.75, right there. And then way over here, you have the point x equals 2, y equals 8. So yeah, and you connect these with a straight line. I think I used red before, so I'll stick with red. you get this line. Right? Remember, this is it's passing through two points, so it is a secant line. So yeah, just blowing this up a little bit. It's very sloppy up here, but down here it might be easier to see. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to calculate uh, the slope of this line. That's part B. So part B, which I guess I'll do down here, Find the slope of this line, this red line here, right? Well, you can do that by just using the usual formula for slope, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? By now you should know that, right? So what's my x1, y1, and x2, y2? It turns out it doesn't matter which one you call which, but since this is on the left, let's call this x1, y1. And this that will make this x2 and y2 up here. So that's a 2. 
Uh, but if you switch them, if you call this, this one here x1, y1, and this x2, y2, it's not going to matter as long as you're you know, consistent about your x's and y's. All right, so y2 is 8.75, right? And y1 was 8. x2 is 2.5. And x1 was 2. So we get 0 0.75 divided by 0 0.5. Uh, which is 3 over 4 divided by 1 half, which I think is 3 over 2. 3 over 4 times 2 over 1. Yep, 3 over 2. So 1.5. Now, I know that doesn't look like it, right? This, this looks like the slope might be more like, you know, 2 over 3 or something, or 1 half. Remember, I changed the scale. Remember, right, so the scale is way off here, right? If I did the right scale here, right, this might be, you know, one, two, three, four instead of one. So, yeah. So that's why it doesn't look right. But if I drew this correctly, the slope would be three over two or 1.5. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not picky about decimals or fractions, either way is fine. Um, just, just as long as you're precise, right? If, if we do get a slope of something like two-thirds, then I, I prefer you write it as a fraction. Don't write it as 0.6666666666 and so on, right? If you must, at least put the bar over the 6 indicating that it's repeating because otherwise it's just an approximation, right? So if you only write 0 0.6666, then it's not exact. It's only an approximation. All right. So, all right. So with that, uh, we did the first part here. We did part A and part B when x is 2.5. What about when x is 1.5? So now here's 1.5. We go all the way up to the graph, and now we have this point here. So let's connect these two points with a straight line. Again, very sloppy, um, and I'm not even sure I can do it right here, but let's, let's try. Let's say way down here is your 1.5 for x, and what's y going to be? Well, remember, y is just f of x, and the function was 6 times x, which is 1.5, minus x squared. So your calculator will spit out 6.75. Okay, so yeah, this point on the graph right here where we want the secant line, x is 1.5 and y is 6.75, 6 and 3 quarters, right? So, so yes, over here, that's going to be... This line here, this green line here, we fill in the y, 6.75, right? So for part b, we're going to use the same formula for slope. But now, this will be my x1, y1, and this will be x2, y2. So yep, same formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And that's going to give us, uh, let's see, 8 minus 6.75 for the difference in the y's, and 2 minus 1.5, right? So now we're at 1.25 divided by 0 0.5, 125 divided by 50, I think is 5 over 2, right? So 2 and a half. And that makes sense, right? Because this green line is definitely steeper than the red line, so it should have a bigger slope. It should have a bigger slope than the red line. Um, and I know I didn't do this in red here, but this is the slope of, the, of this red line up here. I hope that helps. All right. So part C then asks us to estimate the slope of the tangent line at x equals 2 here. So what color should I use for the tangent line? 
at this point right here, I'm just going to use blue, and the tangent line will look something like this. Let's try that again. Yep. So this blue line here is roughly the tangent line. And what can we say about its slope? Not much, right? But notice that it's slightly steeper than the red line, which means the slope has to be bigger than 1.5, right? So, yep, the slope of this line here, the slope of the tangent line, tangent line, is certainly going to be bigger than 1.5. But notice, it's not quite as steep as the green line which means it has to be less than the slope of the green line. The green line was 2.5. So all we can say for sure is that the slope of the tangent line, this slope of this line right here, the blue line, is somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5, somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5. And OK. Now, maybe it's exactly halfway between. Right, so maybe the slope of the tangent line is exactly 2. Now, it turns out that that's right. But we have no reason to think that here. Right, that's, that's just, it looks like a coincidence, right? But it does turn out to be exactly 2 in this case. Um, but if you said, you know, if it looks like maybe 1.8, 1 1.9, or maybe 2.1, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be far off, right? It's all we're doing is estimating. We're only approximating here, right? This is just an estimate. So even two is just an estimate. If you're guessing that it's halfway in between, well, that's a good guess. And it, that happens to be right in this case, but it's it's not necessarily true in every case. So don't generalize that when you do this, that the slope is exactly halfway between these two slopes. That just, that just happened to be the case here. Okay, so, so yeah, we use these two secant lines, the red one and the green one, um, and then the blue line have, has a slope somewhere in between, and it's so somewhere between the two, the two lines, between 1.5 and 2.5. And uh, yeah, it does happen to be exactly 2. Okay, so, so yeah. You know, our estimate here would be 2, but again, if you said 1.8, 1.9, 2.1, 2.2, right, those are all reasonable guesses. It just happens to be exactly 2 for the tangent line. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, again, this is a typical example. Um, you should probably try number 7. It's a very similar example to this. Um, and... Uh, I bet you do it for section 1.1. Again, nothing really specific here. We're just kind of giving you a very brief survey of what's to come. Um, I mean, I know this business about slope, of course, uh, is a good review. But if you want to know more review, in particular having to do with slope, or with things like functions, our book has a very good uh, review chapter for it. it it's chapter P, uh, in this case P for, I think, preparation or preliminaries. Yep. Uh, yeah, preparation or preview maybe. Uh, oh, no, 1.1 is the preview. Yeah, so preparation, right? So it's, it's basically a review chapter. Um, and so you might want to look at that. If, if you're fuzzy at all about slope or functions or domain and range, things like that, um, then, yeah, then definitely look at some of the sections in Chapter P, and you might even want to try some of the exercises. I know you don't have a whole lot of time to do that. Um, but, yeah, so I'm hoping that all this should get you through the exercises in, in the first section, and, um, and then we'll continue with the next section.